Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection Series 14, Program 11. When you look at coats of hand-loomed fabric in top quality shops, your heart has to beat a little faster as they're just wonderful. Hand-woven fabric is available by the yard sometimes in shops, but mostly from weavers. Uh, the price tag might make you blink when you consider the process, though. One yarn at a time, it seems pretty reasonable. I have back here a coat that I just made of hand-woven fabric. And uh, what also is fun about it is the fact that it's a real challenge sometimes because of the special considerations you have to uh, take. For instance, hand-loomed fabric is usually narrower than what you're used to. Ordinarily, when you buy wool, as this is, it would be about 60 inches wide. Well, this wasn't. It was a lot narrower than that. And also, I got all that she had remaining of this particular one, and it wasn't really a whole lot. So I found that, okay, I'm going to have to play with this a little bit. I'm going to have to think about it. What I did is make this so that uh, there is a raglan sleeve here in front, but in front only. The whole back and sleeve, the whole sleeve is attached to the back. And this is because this is how it worked out on my fabric, which wasn't very much. So it's actually, on the back side, it's actually uh, just a... a all one piece, they said, and this is the only separate piece, the front here. What I also did, of course, is put some pockets in. Uh, it overlaps considerably in front, and it has slightly a cutaway neckline, uh, some buttons and buttonholes there. And with a little extra hand-loomed fabric, ravels so beautifully, why not uh, put a little tassel, a little fringe here and there. I'll probably put more on than what I have, but I'll concentrate it in this place. I'm not going to put it all over everywhere. I just wanted a little something decorative over here on the right shoulder is all. Well, to make that pattern, first of all, I want to make a little uh, plan for myself and just scrawl it on a piece of paper. I usually try it out on something to see. And of course, before I did this, I was trying to, on the limited amount of fabric I had, this is opened up. You know, I just have some denim right now, but if this would be my fabric, my wool, this is opened up. It's not with a fold in it. It is just one layer and it's only this wide. So you have to think pretty carefully, especially with limited space. I didn't have enough for the backs, the front, and uh, also the sleeves separately. That's why something had to be connected. So I made a little plan after I played with the patterner at great length to see how it would fit. And this is it, very careless, very casual here. But it occurred to me that what I'm going to have to do is to make a kimono sleeve, a, a one piece back and sleeve here all together, and then a front and sleeve all together. But there was no way I was going to fit this front on the limited amount of fabric. So it hit me that, ah, why not just turn the front into a raglan? Why not cut it off right there, bring this sleeve that I cut off around to join with the back and put it all together. Now, does that make sense to you? That works? Okay, you can do so many things with patterns that you wouldn't believe possible until you start playing with them. And I very often do it in a small form like this, just so I won't waste a lot of time in big pieces of paper or, or pattern tracer or whatever, just because it's easier to get it in your mind, because it's mainly a mind game, and you just need to firm it up in your mind to see if it'll work before you do anything. Then when I actually did this on, uh, and I didn't do it on this fabric or on the hand-woven fabric right away, never. I'm always going to make a test pattern when I work with hand-woven fabric to make sure it works the way my mind thinks it's going to work. But what I did first of all is decide, okay, I have to have a kimono sleeve, so I'll take off this set-in sleeve and just put in the kimono instead. And along with putting that kimono sleeve on, I need to uh, change it to my size. And because this is a coat, and because I will be wearing it over other garments, maybe a blouse, maybe a sweater, I'm going to make it bigger than the patterner actually is. So I'm going to just uh, tell the patterner that I'm uh, about a size and a half bigger than I really am instead of my real size. I'll move it out here about one and a half sizes bigger and tighten this up. And then I'm going to leave this temporarily because what I do first of all is just trace up the front and around the neck. But remember, I want an overlap at front. So here's the center front. I want it to overlap this much. 
Therefore, I will just leave this alone. This is the edge of the fabric. It's the selvage right now. And that selvage is firmer, and it's fine to just leave it there if, uh, if, as long as it's not wide, as long as it won't show. In fact, every once in a while, I see people making things with hand-woven fabric, and they actually leave the selvage there as a decorative thing because possibly it's pretty. And maybe you do actually want to show off just every little bit of this. But what I would do is then for the front, just go ahead and trace this around on my test pattern and go ahead and bring out the sleeves and I would uh, bottom also. Actually, I added some width to it or some length. So I would bring that down. And then when I needed to come over here, then is when I need to actually move this out sideways to what my uh, uh, width would be. And I'm looking over here along this black, this heavy black line is where I'm looking to move it out to the bigger size that I want to make it. And then you have to think too, okay, you're wearing it over maybe bulky clothes. Is this hip area going to be wide enough? Take a tape measure and see because it's very easy to know exactly what you have. Remember, there are no seams on a basic like this. It's also called a sloper and there are no seams on it. You add those. And so what I want to do is measure this and see is it big enough or is it likely over pants, over a sweater? I'll need it a little bigger. In that case, just move out the hip a little bit and uh, go ahead and do something a little bit bigger so that uh, you won't have to worry about is it going to fit or isn't it. And then when I got it out here, I went ahead and uh, traced it up the side. And now remember, this is the stitching line I'm doing. It's not the cutting line. When I actually cut this, I would have to make it that half inch or five eighths inch bigger. And I thought, I don't want it to come up this high under the arm. I want it instead to just curve around a little bit. So use a, a curve stick or a French curve here or eyeball it, whatever you'd prefer to do. Uh, but I very often just use this to get a good curve going. So here's a curve I could trace for my cutting line and turn it over and then just join the sleeve. And here it's just a matter of deciding how long does that sleeve need to be, including the hem, if I have enough for a hem. And if I don't, this is when you opt for a facing around the wrist instead of a hem if you don't have enough fabric. So uh, what I needed to do is measure how long my arm would be. Front, and I already have that on a measurement chart. Remember, I did that several programs ago. So I just need to measure from my neck point here down the arm. And if I have enough, wonderful. If I don't, then I'll go ahead and add. And uh, I'm going to put a facing on mine because there is not a hem there. And so this is an easy thing to do just by making a straight line. So either use a ruler or whatever it is you prefer and uh, go ahead and draw that. And by the time you draw all this, and I'm going to taper this and make the sleeves a little bit narrower, so I'll just move it like this. You can, uh, it's, it's going to work. You know, you can work with this so easily and it's going to work. Uh, not only will I cut out this front, uh, but I'll also do the back. And remember this pattern or back and front are the very same except when we cut out the front line, it's always cut along these dots. It's cut a little bit shorter, about three quarters shorter. And we cut out the back, it's cut down a little lower. And if you're thinking right away, ah, oh, what does that do at the side seam then when you try to stitch them together? Does that mean that uh, they aren't going to fit? No, because when you do this, there's always a sleeve front or a shoulder front and a shoulder back. And the shoulder back is cut down a little bit more because as you look at your side view, your back is probably slightly rounded and it's a little bit longer space in the back. That's why the back is cut down a little bit lower. And so when you come down here and cut out the hemline, then it works out just perfectly. But when I'm making drastic changes, as I am for this, and when I come down to that final uh, bottom there, I want to make sure that everything fits completely. So what I will do is I'll actually fit the two together in my test fabric, or else maybe I'll measure with the tape measure standing on end. Perhaps I'll measure to make sure that this front pattern that I have drawn and the back pattern that I'm going to draw to make sure they measure the same thing so that I know I will have two seams to stitch together that will exactly work. 
So remember all these things. I always check my pattern if I'm doing changes like that and not using uh, the basic just as it is. I always check the measurements to make sure that the seams that are going to sew together will actually be the same length. The only way they would not be the same length is if you have, for instance, some ease to work in. Like set-in sleeves, the sleeve cap is going to be probably about an inch bigger than the arm's eye into which you set it. And so, you know, think about these things. Well, anyway, this is how it goes. When I did this then on the back too, I uh, then after I took the patterners off, I just decided on a line. And you can see here that line comes from somewhere here in the front neck, here would be the shoulder, so it comes just barely there and comes over here. So it's just a simple matter of drawing a line there. And you can draw this a straight line with a ruler, or you can make it a little curved line if you would prefer. Uh, you're the designer when you do this. You can do whatever you want. After you separate it, you just have to add a seam allowance to each one, and they stitch together very nicely. But what I did was draw this line so that this actual piece could be cut off and added to the back to make the back and the whole sleeve all in one piece. Does that seem reasonable to you? Well, it actually does work out just beautifully. Well, after we get our pattern all drawn and get our fabric all cut out, we're going to have to think probably about some finishing tactics on that fabric because typically handwoven fabric ravels rather easily and we want to make very sure that we have everything protected before we start. What I did on this one was immediately uh, back it all and uh, this was just out of a lightweight fusible interfacing because I didn't want anything too heavy. It was just kind of lightweight, uh, pr probably a fusible trico or something similar to that and back the whole thing. So that's going to hold it all together nicely. Some hand woven, some hand loomed fabrics are tightly woven enough that you don't need to do that, others you do. So you play it case by case and see what, what it demands, what it asks you to do to it. Uh, I thought it wouldn't be too bad if we had a little extra firmness every place and also a little extra warmth because it's a car coat really. I'm going to wear it in cool weather, not, not Arctic weather, weather, uh, but cool weather. And uh, so I did want a little extra there all over. Well, after this is all backed, I still want to take mine to the serger and finish all the edges because even with the fusible backing there, it still can ravel. So it's just a little precaution and it just makes it nicer. Now it's very rare that I'd make anything like this that I didn't line. So everything inside is going to be covered up by the lining. So it doesn't matter about making the seams pretty. I usually like to do as little as possible with those seams if I'm going to line because I don't want to put any extra bulk, any extra firmness, and most especially, I don't want the impression of those seams to show on the outside of the fabric if it's a smooth, sensitive fabric. Now, this obviously is not. It's very textury, and so you don't have any of those worries with it. Uh, while we have it here, I also, I'm going to go over the machine in a minute and, and work with it, but I also wanted to show you that we have a little fringe here. Uh, well, anything else I guess we have, I can just show you on the, on the machine. And uh, let me show you before we move over there exactly what my finished pattern then looked like because it changed uh, considerably from the way I started out by the time I cut up some and added it to the other. Okay, here's the front. And so the front looks like this. You can see the sleeve is cut off, and I did cut it a little longer, actually, and I flared it a little more because this is kind of an A-line coat. It does flare. And then the back and the sleeve look very, very strange. Here they are. There's nothing terribly strange about the front, so I'll move it out of the way. But here is the back and the sleeve. And the reason that front looks so flared and the reason that front looks so wide is because some of this back has been cut off. The way it fit on the fabric and the way one piece had to go into another piece, uh, it turned out that something had to go here. I couldn't have all the fabric here that I originally had. So I sliced off another little bit there and taped that onto the front and then everything worked out very well. Now as far as facings go, they're of course just duplicates of the outside pattern, so that's never a problem. Here's my sleeve facing, which was nothing but a straight piece. And here's my front facing, which is an exact duplicate of the front. So here's the front facing over here. 
And uh, here's the back facing, and it also is just a duplicate of the back. And it was cut on the fold, even though the back was not. And the reason, remember, the back was not cut on the fold at the center back is because the fabric isn't that wide, so I had to have a seam there. And that's not all bad anyway, because if you're going to have hand-loomed fabric, it sometimes is a little bit stretchy. There may be a little more give there than in machine-woven fabric, and it's not bad to stabilize it by having a center back seam where you're going to sit on it and possibly have a tendency to stretch it out longer. So does that all set all right in your mind? When I got all finished cutting this out, by the way, here are the remains. That was it. So you can see I did have to work pretty carefully to get all this to work out just right. Now I said hand woven fabric ravels so beautifully and here you can see a little sample of what I have fused to the back. Well, what's fun about the way it ravels is that it looks different in the two directions. For instance, this one would have been going, let me see, crosswise. Okay, so when it's raveled here, I have the sparkles coming out here. If I had raveled this the opposite direction, it would have a completely different look because those sparkly threads, yarns, don't go in the lengthwise direction. And you can see here then it would just look kind of woolly and it would have some of these uh, looped yarns that would go in the uh, up and down the vertical direction that don't go in the crosswise direction. So it's really interesting what you can do with these hand woven fabrics by turning them one way or the other. Now usually, or with this one anyway, this also has kind of the look of stripes in it, even though there really aren't uh, specific stripes. But it's just because a lot of these dominant yarns that are going lengthwise give the illusion of stripes because you can see those yarns. Those are the loopy yarns that are here, and so they show up a lot more. Uh, so think also, before you ever start to cut, stand in front of a mirror, put that fabric around you, and see which way it's going to look best on you. Uh, probably it gives a longer, leaner look if you put it up and down. But if you're going to break it up much, you want, might want to do some diagonals. You might want to do some different things with it. So see what works out for you. Play with it, though. And if you want to simulate this, a good way to do that is perhaps just to use some, oh, inexpensive cotton fabric that you have in your stash or that you go to the store and buy, but some cotton fabric that is maybe with a striped look so that uh, you can then test such odd cuts that you might want to make, whether they're going to be diagonal or straight or however. Well, there are a couple of uh, other hand-loomed fabrics that I would like you to see on some models before I do anything here. And uh, one of them is Wendy Hans. She's from Richland, Washington. And she has a jacket that I did on TV uh, two series ago, right on right at the end of series 11. Three, well, anyway, a few series back it was. And what this is is uh, you just make the body of this coat from a rectangle. There is no shape in it whatsoever. And uh, you make it as wide as you want it. And then, of course, it's enormously wide on the shoulders. So see those two pleats that she has, those flanges up on the shoulder? That's to bring it in to make it a lot narrower. Now, she only had enough hand-woven fabric to make the body of the jacket, and she didn't have any more than that. So what she has done is add another fabric to it. She has cotton sleeves there, and they're a heavy cotton. They're not denim, but they're a heavy cotton. And what she's done on that is a lot of decorative stitching to bring in all the colors of the hand-woven fabric so that we can see exactly what's in it. Now, what's also fun about that is that it's a convertible. If you'll remember that show way back at the end of series 11, the sleeves zip out, and it can be a vest as well as a jacket. Then we have another one that's a vest, and this is actually not a hand-loomed fabric. It is rather just a machine-woven vest front, but it's sort of nubby, and it has the look of a hand-loomed fabric. So June did a little bit more on it to make it really look like it was hand-loomed. And uh, what she did was, oh, some really fun things. She has some extra, a lot of threads just cut and stitched on, maybe with clear monofilament thread. Uh, or maybe she did them with metallic threads. 
and she did a little raveling here and there. And see those kind of primitive cave painting type figures that she has in there? Would you believe a ballpoint pen is what put those on? She just uh, drew them there, but it really gives it a lot of character and a lot of fun. Now what I especially want you to look at on, at June's vest is those buttonholes in front because that's something fun that you can do on hand loom fabric and I'm going to show you the look of it here. And uh, you might also do this to repair something you have at home, that the buttonholes are perhaps looking a little threadbare, and you might just do this as a repair job. After you already have the buttonhole, you can just put a piece of fabric down on top and stitch around the original buttonhole. If I would do that, I'd turn it over so I could see the buttonhole and just stitch around it there, just make sure it's centered. And then after you get that stitched, and uh, that would just be a straight stitch, or what June did is make the buttonhole completely. She just put it under there and made the buttonhole through all the layers of fabric, which you can do too. So alternatives here, whichever. Uh, but whatever, once that patch is all sewn on, if you will just take a tapestry needle, my favorite little gadget that is just blunt point, big eye, uh, if you will just take a tapestry needle, don't even uh, bother to, what I did was cut this on the bias, please notice, for one thing, uh, because you get a lot more yarns this way and you don't have bare corners. If you would cut this on the straight, you'd ravel it out and you'd have all these yarns, you'd have all these yarns, you'd have nothing on the corners. So I have this raveled out. Uh, with the tapestry needle so that it actually has a fringe going all the way around the buttonhole and it looks kind of pretty that way. So uh, once it's raveled out, give it a haircut if anything's hanging out too long. But other than that, you have no problems whatsoever. So trim off whatever is extra there. And when you do something like this, you might also want to plan, well, let's work to the advantage of those yarns that are in here. Maybe you want it to look real glitzy if you do have any metallics in yours. And if that's the case, maybe use two layers of this and uh, turn them on the straight instead of on the uh, diagonal and have it so that those yarns can be woven out both on the sides and at the bottom and top and have the metallics all the way or whatever the yarns are that you like best. So that's another possibility. I especially like this. And I think I might just add that to my jacket that I have finished even though it isn't there right now. Now what is on my jacket, remember, is that little, those little tassels on the shoulder. You can do that with either one of those those latch hook things that you put through, or you can do it again with a tapestry needle. And what I have is just some yarn uh, raveled out of the fabric, going through the big eye of the needle. And if you'll just take a little uh, bit of your fabric there and pull it through, and then you loop it through the two raw ends, the two open ends, you loop it through the actual fold of the yarn, the loop of it. And this is a kind of a strange yarn that I pulled out here. This one looks like ribbon floss. And uh, this one maybe is a little long, so cut off those tassels a little shorter, whatever. But I just did a whole lot of those on my jacket and used all the yarns just to give it a little uh, bigger interest. Now, each of these individual yarns are so pretty, they could each be knit into a sweater or something else if you're a knitter. But I thought, let's show all those individual yarns, when, which don't show all that much, when they're together in the fabric. So that's why I put the fringe on, just to uh, make them a little more outstanding. Something else you might do to finish the edges of a hand-woven fabric, because a dull needle will go through so easily, how about lacing it? Here I've started lacing this scrap with some metallic cord. And of course, that's going to be easy to do. It's just taking a little stitch round and round. Or if you don't want the glitzy look on it, this is just a real thin strip of suede that I've cut, some uh, man-made suede. And if I thread that through, that's another easy thing to lace through it. And uh, just make sure that when you lace, you don't let it all twist because this is going to be not a round one like the original cord was that I had here, but this is going to be a flat cord since it's about an eighth inch uh, slice that I cut off. Therefore, this one I would want to keep straight. So every time I bring it through when I get up close, I'm going to straighten that out so that it looks nice as it goes around. Uh, time after time. So this is another pretty thing that you might do to the edge. And this is another thing you might do to repair something in your closet 
that looks a little over the hill that needs some help, you might just do some lacing like this around the edge if you have some edge where it gets worn easily or around a sleeve cuff where it gets worn easily. You might do something of this to distract from it. Because this ravels so easily, you might also just do several little ravelings like this. Now what I did with this is turn it over, stitch it on machine, and then I raveled out the extra. But several rows like this would be pretty, and this might be a way of lengthening something or making it bigger. Well, something as precious as hand-loomed fabric deserves special treatment. But don't clutch. You can do it. Uh, what we also might do is, I have another piece of hand-loom fabric. Uh, I'm going to talk about a clutch, but I'm going to talk about my hand loom fabric here, too. And what this is, is actually by the same weaver. Again, it has kind of a stripy look, and I'm ready to start this. So planning is always necessary when you're going to uh, be doing anything that is valuable to you. And so I noticed that in my stash I have some suede left over from another project that really goes well with all the colors I have in here. So this is the fun, the most fun stage for me actually, the planning stage. It's uh, thinking, okay, here I have my purple box of buttons. Let's see what I have to go with it. Maybe something good and maybe it says take a trip to the store. If nothing looks all that outstanding with it, then it's okay, let's go shop. Here's something that, oh, has several of those colors, so it might be a possibility. But get all that planned and then go shopping if you need to. And uh, this is the clutch I was talking about. Now, these little clutches are a lot of fun to make, and this is for the blouse I'm wearing. So these little bags are more fun to make, and perhaps we could dream up one to go with not only this outfit, but with any outfit you have. So come along next time, and we'll make a bunch of them.